Amen. Well, good morning, everyone. And thank you so much for choosing to fellowship at Access Church today. As we begin a brand new series on one of my most favorite subjects, the Holy Spirit. Amen. And A.W. Tozer, who was a famous American preacher, he once said that when we have the Holy Spirit, we have all that is needed to be all that God desires us to be. When we have the Holy Spirit, we have all that is needed to be all that God desires us to be. But the Holy Spirit is very often one of the most misunderstood and least understood persons. Very often we may understand who God the Father is, we may understand who Jesus is, But do we really understand who the Holy Spirit is? And a good starting point to begin our series this morning would would be to answer the question, who is the Holy Spirit? And there are three things that we need to know concerning the Holy Spirit. Number one is that the Holy Spirit is a person. He is not a force. He is not an energy. He is not a thing. He is not an it. He is a person. Nowhere in the Bible is the Holy Spirit referred to as it, but always as he. Jesus speaking in John 15, 26 says this. He says, but when the helper comes, whom I shall send to you from the Father, the spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, he will testify of me. Not it, but he. Later on in John 16, from verse 12 to 14, Jesus speaking again says this, I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. However, when He, the Spirit of truth, has come, He will guide you into all truth, for He will not speak on His own authority, but whatever He hears, He will speak, and He will tell you things to come. He will glorify Me, for He will take of what is mine and declare it to you. The Holy Spirit is a person. And being a person means that the Holy Spirit has a mind. He has a will. He can speak. He can love. But it also means that the Holy Spirit has feelings. He can be offended and he can be grieved as well. The Holy Spirit is the third person in the Trinity. We know that as believers, we serve a triune God. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And that brings me to my second point concerning who He is, is that the Holy Spirit is God. He is God. And one example that shows us that He is God is a story found in the book of Acts chapter 5 from verse 1 to 4, and it's the story of Ananias and Sapphira. And this is what it says, Acts chapter 5 from verse 1 to 4. It says, But a certain man named Ananias, with his wife Sapphira, sold a possession, and he kept back part of the proceeds, his wife also being aware of it, and brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and keep back part of the price of the land for yourself. While it remained, was it not your own? And after it was sold, was it not in your control? Why have you conceived this thing in your heart? You have not lied to men, but to God. You see, earlier on, Peter references the Holy Spirit, and later on he says, you have not lied to men, but to God. The Holy Spirit is God. He is the third person in the Trinity and he is God. And being God, there are some key qualities that we need to know about him. And I want to give you five qualities that we need to know concerning the Holy Spirit. Number one, the Holy Spirit is omnipotent. And when we say omnipotent, we mean that the Holy Spirit is all-powerful. He is all-powerful. Number two, he is omniscient. Omniscient means that the Holy Spirit knows everything. 
He knows everything about us. There's nothing we can hide from the Holy Spirit. He knows everything. He is omniscient. The third thing we need to know about the Holy Spirit is that He is omnipresent. That means He can be everywhere at the same time. While we have different church services happening across the city, happening across the country, happening across the world, He can be everywhere at the same time. Number four is that He is immutable. What does that word immutable mean? It means He does not change. He does not mutate. He is immutable. Like Jesus, like the Father, He is the same yesterday, today and forever. And number five, the thing we need to understand about the Holy Spirit is that He is eternal. Eternal means that He has existed forever. No one created Him. He has always been there, along with God the Father and God the Son. So He is omnipotent. He is omniscient. He is omnipresent. He is immutable and He is eternal. So we know that He is a person, we know that He is God. But the third thing that we need to know concerning the Holy Spirit is that as His name tells us, He is a spirit. He is a spirit. And being a spirit means that He is invisible. He cannot be seen. And that is why He is sometimes also referred to as the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost. He is invisible. We cannot see Him with our naked eyes. And because we cannot see the Holy Spirit, we have to receive the Holy Spirit by faith. We have to receive Him by faith. In the Old Testament, the word for spirit is this word ruach. Ruach, it's a Hebrew word, and it means breath, it means wind, it means a violent exaltation or a blast of breath. In the New Testament, the word for spirit is this Greek word pneuma. And it's where we get the word pneumatic, something that functions with air, like a pneumatic drill. And the word pneuma means a current of air, a blast of breath, a strong breeze. And like the wind, like our very breath, just because we cannot see the Holy Spirit does not mean He does not exist. I want you to do something for me this morning. I want you to take your hand and I want you to blow into your hand. You felt something, am I right? But you didn't see it. And that's the same thing with the Holy Spirit. We cannot see Him, but that does not negate the fact that He does exist. So that is who He is. He is a person, He is God, and He is a Spirit. Now the ministry of the Holy Spirit is so great and vast that it would be impossible to cover it in just two messages. And so for the purpose of this series, I'm just going to cover the ministry and the work of the Holy Spirit in the life of a believer. What is his role in our lives? But I would also just want to highlight the ministry of the Holy Spirit was a key component in the life of Jesus. Not only is the ministry of the Holy Spirit a key component in our lives today, but he was a vital component even in the life and ministry of Jesus. You see, Jesus was conceived by the Spirit. He was anointed by the Spirit. He was sealed by the Spirit. He was led by the Spirit. We know after fasting for 40 days that He was led into the wilderness by the Spirit. He was empowered by the Spirit. He was filled by the Spirit or with the Spirit. But He was also raised by the Spirit. And the same Spirit that raised Christ from the dead lives in you and I. Now if Jesus, the Son of God, needed the Holy Spirit then, how much more do you and I need the Holy Spirit? How can we think that we cannot do life without the Holy Spirit? You see, the Holy Spirit is the most important person on earth. And He has the most important work on earth. So what is that work in the life of you and I seated here today? And while this is by no means an exhaustive list in terms of what I'm going to share with you this morning, besides producing fruit and giving us gifts, 
which is what we generally speak about when we talk about the Holy Spirit. I want to share with you this morning 12 things that the Holy Spirit does in the life of a believer. 12 things. Because very often when we speak about the Holy Spirit, we can just limit Him to the fruit of the Spirit that He produces in our lives or the gifts that He gives us, the gifts that He bestows upon us in order to do the work of ministry. But there are 12 other things that the Holy Spirit does in the life of a believer. Number one, the Holy Spirit convicts us of sin and draws us to Jesus. You see, it's the Holy Spirit that reveals Jesus to us. In actual fact, our salvation is the result of the Holy Spirit drawing us to Jesus. In John 16, from verse 8 to 11, this is what the Bible says. It says this, And when He has come, He will convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment, of sin because they do not believe in Me, of righteousness because I go to My Father and you see Me no more, of judgment because the ruler of this world is judged. That is Jesus speaking. He says when the Holy Spirit comes, He will convict. He will convict the world. Now the world also includes you and I. It's everyone he will bring conviction to. You see the Holy Spirit convicts us, but he does not condemn us. And there's a difference between conviction and condemnation. He convicts us, but he does not condemn us. Condemnation is not from the Holy Spirit, but conviction is. Conviction is. The second thing that the Holy Spirit does is that he regenerates and he renews us. He makes us alive. We who were spiritually dead, He regenerates us and He renews us. In Titus 3 from verse 4 to 6, this is what the Bible says. It says, But when the kindness and the love of God, our Savior, toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to His mercy, He saved us through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit, whom He poured out on us abundantly through Jesus Christ, our Savior. You see, regeneration is the act whereby we who, are, who were spiritually dead are now made alive at the point of salvation. It is the Holy Spirit who makes us anew and alive in Christ. That is the work of the Holy Spirit. It is not our work. It is the work of the Holy Spirit. The third thing that the Holy Spirit does is that He assures us of our salvation. How many of you have ever doubted your salvation? You know, there are certain times when I was young, I was like, man, am I really saved? Sometimes we begin to look at our behavior and the things we do, and we can doubt our salvation. But it is the Holy Spirit who assures us of our salvation. Romans 8.16 says this, The Spirit Himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Ephesians 1 from verse 13 to 14 says this, And now, you Gentiles, have also heard the truth, the good news that God saves you. And when you believed in Christ, He identified you as His own by giving you the Holy Spirit, whom He promised long ago. The Spirit is, is God's guarantee that, we, that He will give us the inheritance He promised and that He has purchased us to be His own people. He did this so we could praise and glorify Him. You see, when we receive the Holy Spirit, the Spirit becomes the seal of our salvation. The seal of our salvation. And He is the one that assures us of our salvation. The fourth thing that the Holy Spirit does is that the Holy Spirit sanctifies us. The Holy Spirit doesn't leave us the same, but He sanctifies us. In 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 13 it says this, but we ought always to thank God for you, brothers and sisters, loved by the Lord, because God chose you as firstfruits to be saved through the sanctifying work of the Spirit and through belief in the truth. You see, along with, with God's Word, it is the Holy Spirit that purifies us, that sets us apart, that makes us holy. That is the process of sanctification, where we become set apart, where we become more holy. The Holy Spirit does that. The fifth thing that the Holy Spirit does is that the Holy Spirit strengthens us. The Holy Spirit strengthens us. 
Second Thessalonians, uh, sorry, Ephesians 3.16 says this. I pray that from His glorious unlimited resources, He will empower you with inner strength through His Spirit. He will empower you with inner strength. And maybe you are weak this morning. I want you to know that it is the Holy Spirit who can strengthen you. He can strengthen you. One of the other portions of Scripture in the Bible tells us that the Holy Spirit can even quicken our mortal bodies. Where we feel lifeless, where we are just drained, it's the Holy Spirit that can come and strengthen us. Number six, the Holy Spirit leads us and guides us into truth. He leads us and He guides us. John 16 verse 13 says this, But when He, the Spirit of truth, comes, He will guide you into all truth. He will not speak on His own. He will speak only what He hears, and He will tell you what is yet to come. Romans 8.14 says this, For those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. If you are struggling this morning with the lies of the enemy, if the enemy has been taunting you and tormenting you with lies, it is the Holy Spirit who can guide you into truth. He is the one that can reveal God's truth to you. If you are seeking direction this morning, it is the Holy Spirit who can lead you. I think every day I need direction. But if I didn't have the Holy Spirit, man, where would I go? It is the Holy Spirit who directs us. Number seven, the Holy Spirit allows us to experience freedom. He allows us to experience freedom. 2 Corinthians 3.17 says this, Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. If you feel bound this morning, allow the Holy Spirit to bring freedom to your life. That is what He comes to do. He comes to break off the chains. He comes to set you free. There is freedom in the presence of the Holy Spirit. Number eight, the Holy Spirit fills us with God's love. The Holy Spirit fills us with God's love. Romans 5 verse 5 says this, And hope does not put us to shame, because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit, who has, gi who has been given to us. It is the Holy Spirit who pours the love of God into our hearts. And if you need to experience the love of God this morning, ask the Holy Spirit to fill you with that love. You see, you can't give what you don't have. Many of us are trying to love. We are trying to love other people. But we first need to experience and encounter the unconditional love of God. And it's the Holy Spirit that fills us with God's love so we can start to love others as well. And if you are battling with love this morning, allow the Holy Spirit to begin to fill you with His love. Number nine, the Holy Spirit makes us more like Jesus. The Holy Spirit makes us more like Jesus. 2 Corinthians 3.18 says this, And we all who with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory are being transformed into His image with ever-increasing glory which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. It is the Holy Spirit who conforms us into the image of Christ. He makes us more like Jesus. Makes us more like Jesus. You know, in the Old Testament biblical times, even in the New Testament, to speak for that matter, when gold was refined, it was placed into the fire and the goldsmith if he was working with gold or the silversmith if they were working with silver the way they knew that all of the impurities were removed from that precious metal was when they removed it from the fire and the goldsmith or the silversmith saw his face or his image in the gold and that's what the Holy Spirit wants to do in our lives as well when people see us when our families look at us, do they see Jesus in us? Or is still there so much of these impurities that come from the world? And it's the, the job of the Holy Spirit to make us more like Jesus. 
And it's a daily process. We move from glory to glory. We are all on a journey. Not one of us here this morning can say that we have arrived. But we're all on this journey. Number 10, the Holy Spirit helps us in our prayer life. The Holy Spirit helps us in our prayer life. Romans 8.26 says this, Likewise, the Spirit also helps us in our weaknesses, for we do not know what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. You see, when you don't know how to pray, it's the Holy Spirit that helps you to pray. He helps you. Number 11, the Holy Spirit teaches us. The Holy Spirit teaches us. 1 John 2, 27 says this, But you have received the Holy Spirit and He lives within you, so you don't need anyone to teach you what is true. For the Spirit teaches you everything you need to know. And what He teaches is true. It is not a lie. So just as He has taught you, remain in fellowship with Christ. You see, it is the Holy Spirit who teaches us. And the Holy Spirit will never contradict the Word of God. Whatever He teaches is always in line with the Word of God. And if you are struggling this morning, even in terms of reading your Bible, ask the Holy Spirit to teach you. To give you illumination and revelation of the Word of God. Now there's no such thing as new revelation. But sometimes for us it is new. Because we've never heard it before. But there's nothing new under the sun, as Ecclesiastes tells us. But some things just need to be unveiled to us. And it's the Holy Spirit who reveals and teaches those things to us. And number 12, the Holy Spirit comforts us. The Holy Spirit comforts us. Acts 9.31 says this, Then the churches throughout all Judea, Galilee, and Samaria had peace and were edified. And walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit, they were multiplied. In the comfort of the Holy Spirit. How many of you here have ever needed comfort? We all have needed comfort at some point in our lives. I love how the Amplified Version breaks down that word comfort in John 14, verse 16. Jesus speaking, and he says this, And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper, comforter, advocate, intercessor, counselor, strengthener, standby, to be with you forever. And the Greek word for that word comforter is this word parakletos. Parakletos. And it means one called or sent, called or sent for to assist another. One called or sent for to assist another. Parakletos. The Holy Spirit has been sent or called to come and assist you and I. To be our comforter. To be our advocate. Our counselor. Our standby. And I want you to know this morning that you don't have to go through life alone, that you have a comforter, that you have an advocate, a counselor, a standby, someone who is standing by and standing with you. But you have to be fully surrendered to him this morning. You have to be fully surrendered to him. And what the Holy Spirit wants is that he wants to be your best and your closest friend. But the Holy Spirit is also a gentleman. He does not force himself on anyone. It is up to us to yield to him. You see, 1 Thessalonians 5, 19 tells us that we should not quench the Holy Spirit. In the Amplified Version, it says this, 1 Thessalonians 5, 19. Do not quench, subdue, or be unresponsive to the working and guidance of the Holy Spirit. So what does that word quench mean? It means we can subdue the working of the Holy Spirit. We can be unresponsive when the Holy Spirit is moving, when He wants to do something in our lives and we don't respond. It is not the problem of the Holy Spirit, it is our problem. 
It's never the problem of the giver. It's, all, it's most often the problem of the receiver. You see, the Holy Spirit has already been given. He was given once on the day of Pentecost. It is our job to receive. Nowhere in the New Testament does it ever tell us to ask for the Holy Spirit to be given. It always says, ask that we would receive the Holy Spirit. And so the problem is not with the giver. Very often it's the problem with the receiver. And that's you and I. And I think sometimes we quench the Holy Spirit because we don't understand who He is and we don't understand very much about Him and the important work that He wants to do on the inside of us. You know, we sing about how we want all of Him. All I need is You, Lord. You're all that I need. And that's great. But does He have all of you? We want all of him. The question is, does he have all of you? It's good to sing more of you, Holy Spirit, more of you. But he wants more of you. Not more of him, but he also needs more of you. And in actual fact, he needs all of you. And how much of him you have, you have is determined by how much of him but uh, how much of him you have is determined by how much of you he's got. And I say that again. How much of him you have is determined by how much of you he's got. You determine how far you want to go with the Holy Spirit. You determine how far you want to go. And this morning I want to read a portion of scripture found in Ezekiel 47 from verse 1 to 12. Ezekiel 47 from verse 1 to 12. It's a long portion of scripture, but I want to read it to you this morning. And this is what it says. It says, The man brought me back to the entrance to the temple, and I saw water coming out from under the threshold of the temple toward the east, for the temple faced the east. The water was coming down from under the south side of the temple, south of the altar. He then brought me out through the north gate and led me around the outside to the outer gate facing east and the water was trickling from the south side. Notice the water is coming out as a trickle. As the man went eastward with a measuring line in his hand, he measured off a thousand cubits and led me through water that was ankle deep. No longer is it a trickle, now it's ankle deep. He measured off another thousand cubits and led me through the water that was knee deep. He measured off another thousand and led me through water that was up to the waist. He measured off another thousand, but now it was a river that I could not cross because the water had risen and was deep enough to swim in, a river that no one could cross. He asked me, Son of man, do you see this? Then he led me back to the bank of the river. When I arrived there, I saw a great number of trees on each side of the river. He said to me, this water flows towards the eastern region and goes down into the Arabah where it enters the Dead Sea. When it empties into the sea, the salty water there becomes fresh. Swarms of living creatures will live wherever the river flows. There will be large numbers of fish because this water flows there and makes the salt water fresh. So where the river flows, everything will live. Fishermen will stand along the shore from En Gedi to En Eglem. There will be places for spreading nets. The fish will be of many kinds, like the fish of the Mediterranean Sea. But the swamps and marshes will not become fresh. They will be left for salt. Fruit trees of all kinds will grow on the banks of the river. Their leaves will not wither, nor will their fruit fail. Every month they will bear fruit because the water from the sanctuary flows to them. Their fruit will serve for food and their leaves for healing. Now what has been spoken about here? It's the Holy Spirit. It's the Holy Spirit. And we determine how far we want to go with the Holy Spirit. It can be a trickle, can, can be ankle deep, can be knee deep, it can be waist deep, or you can be swimming in the river. And when you are in the river, there is fruitfulness. 
there is healing, there is life. John 7 from verse 37 to 39, Jesus speaking, that says this, On the last day and greatest day of the festival, Jesus stood and said in a loud voice, Let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as scripture has said, rivers of living water will flow from within them. Notice what he says. Whoever believes in me, as scripture has said, rivers of living water will flow from within them. Which scripture is he referring to? Well, Ezekiel 47 is one of those scriptures. By this he meant the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were later to receive. Up to that time the Spirit had not yet been given, since Jesus had not yet been glorified. You see, we determine how far we go in terms of the work and the ministry of the Holy Spirit in our lives. It can be a trickle, it can be ankle deep, it can be knee deep, it can be waist deep, or it can be river. I don't know about you, but I, don't, I just don't want to go ankle deep or knee deep. I want to go all in. But in order to go all in, there's one key word. And this is what I want to leave you with this morning, and that word is surrender. That word is surrender. If you haven't made a note of anything this morning, make a note of that word, surrender. Surrender. What does that word surrender mean? It means to yield to the power, control, or possession of another. To yield to the power, the control, or to the possession of another. To give oneself up. To give oneself up. To agree to stop fighting, hiding, or resisting. And very often that is what we do when the Holy Spirit wants to work on the inside of us. What do we do? Very often we resist. We hide. And we even sometimes fight the Holy Spirit. To surrender is to give up control. And if there's one thing that we want in our lives, it's control. We want to control the circumstances. We want to control the situations. We want to control everything. But in order for you and I to really have the Holy Spirit minister to us, it demands us losing that control, giving that control over to Him. You see, you can't surrender and still be in control and still be in charge. Stop resisting Him. And I think we struggle to surrender when we try to understand everything first. And very often that is what happens. Because we don't understand all there is to know about the Holy Spirit, we resist Him. And can I tell you something? You'll never be able to understand everything there is about the Holy Spirit. If your small mind wants to understand the magnitude of the God we serve who created the whole universe, then I don't want to worship a God that can fit into the size of my mind. There's some things you'll never be able to understand. And we, when we try to figure out the Holy Spirit, we are actually trying to now take control. Knowing the Holy Spirit demands surrender. He can only take control when you give Him control. And very often this is how I think we live our lives. I want you to imagine that your life is like a car. There's the outside of the car, which you wash and you polish and it looks nice. But then there's the inside of the car, which sometimes the outside looks nice, but sometimes the inside doesn't look so nice. There's litter there, there's a coffee cup. Some people are looking at their husbands or their wives. <laughs> Some things are not working on the inside. Some gauges are not working. Sometimes the aircon needs regassing. Sometimes there's stuff going wrong uh, on the inside. But then there's also the engine of the car, which is a vital component. And our lives are like that car. There's the body, the outside. There's the soul, the interior of the car. And then there's the engine, the spirit. And when we give our lives to Christ, it's like we get a new engine. The engine that had ceased, stopped functioning, the Holy Spirit, He comes and He puts in the new engine. Nothing really happens to the outside or the inside. That's still a work in progress. But what happens is the, the Holy Spirit now comes 
and he sits in the passenger seat of the car. And sometimes we don't realize that we have someone alongside of us in life's journey. We don't realize, imagine you were driving a car and the person next to you was a navigator. He knew exactly where you needed to go. He was a mechanic. He was an auto electrician. He was a spray painter. He was a panel beater. But you just left him there on the, in the passenger seat. And sometimes that's what we do with the Holy Spirit. We have this car, to, so to speak. It's our lives. But the Holy Spirit doesn't just want to put in the new engine. He wants to start to clean out the interior, take away all of that junk and that litter, fix the stuff that's not working, and that's in the area of our soul. But it's, it, it takes us saying, Holy Spirit, you are my comforter. You are the one beside me. You are the parakletos, my advocate, my standby, my teacher. You are the one that's going to strengthen me. And very often we don't realize who and what we have access to. And sometimes we just want to be in the driver's seat. We think we know where we are going, but yet we have someone beside us who, who, who can direct us, who can lead us. So we don't take the wrong turns in life. So we can, someone we can consult and say, Holy Spirit, won't you show me? Show me where there's potholes ahead and speed bumps and detours. You lead me and you guide me. But in order for that to happen, it, it demands us giving control to him, speaking to him, realizing we're not on this journey alone, but we have someone right beside us who we need to tap into. But the one word that is needed there is this word, surrender.